Hello and welcome to another Optolec Enhanced Vision video. And today I'm very pleased to be joined by John Furs, uh, Claire Hurst and Peter Hurst. Now, John Furs is the Regional Manager for the Macula Society in the Highlands and Islands. And Claire and Peter are the Shetland Support Group, Chairman and Treasurer. So, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. So, uh, first of all, uh, John, I, I, I'll start with you uh, uh, regarding the, uh, the 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 support group and how it formed and how it all started. So, maybe you'd like to uh, to, uh, to to tell us all about it. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. We really welcome the opportunity to working with uh, with Optilec on this this project. I joined the Macula Society in July. 2017 and and I cover the uh, the Highlands and Islands which is basically Highland County, Murray, the Western Isles and the Northern Isles of Orkney and Shetland and in 2017 we did have a group in Orkney but there was no group in in Shetland and I, I saw that as a big omission and started to engage with, uh, with Shetland Council and was very fortunate to come across uh, uh, a young lady in Shetland Council, Hannah Bateson, who uh, shared the same thoughts as myself, that there really needed to be a support group in, in Shetland. And we, we started the process going. There was uh, a couple of visits over to Lerwick. We got BBC Shetland involved and in August 2018, we, we kicked off with the inaugural uh, meeting of the Macula Society Shetland Support Group. And it's just gone from strength to strength. That first meeting, there was nearly 40 people attended. Um, it was very yeah. fortunate that two of those people uh, were Claire and Peter Hurst. <laughs> and... Uh, and in fact, we locked the door and wouldn't let them out until they agreed <laughs> to, be, to be group leader and treasurer. And, and that has been certainly uh, a win-win, not just for the Macula Society, but also for Shetland as well. Um, we, we started at the Eisenberg Community Centre in King Harold Street. And the idea of the support group is that it's the support group supporting the support group and not necessarily okay. led by the nose by uh, the macula society and um, i'm pleased to say the, uh, the 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 group has gone uh, literally from strength to strength so much so uh, that they're self-sustaining and uh, after a few months they decided that they wanted to move to to the market house in Lerwick and, and that has suited them amazingly well. Um, Claire and Peter have been instrumental in setting up a committee and um, so not only do we have a chair and uh, a treasurer we, we now have uh, a, a very active committee with a vice chair and committee people who uh, are, have taken to it like ducks, ducks to water. Um, it's going amazingly well. Um, Claire puts out a, a regular newsletter, The View from the Edge, which is, which is excellent. And we're reaching out into uh, the outer islands and trying to make it as inclusive as we can. Uh, unfortunately, some of our members do not have good IT and that really precludes us from using um, Zoom as yeah. we are today, um, but it does mean uh, everybody's got a telephone call, uh, line, so we're able to use telephone conferencing. And telephone conferencing is the marmite of the operation. Some people love it, some people hate it, um, <laughs> but it is a way of keeping in touch uh, with, with our members. That's pretty well how the the, the group was set up um, and I probably think I should hand over to Claire now um, who can explain in greater detail 
what the monthly meetings are all about and how the support group operates. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Claire, please do. Well, just be, be wary of anybody who asks you to stuff envelopes. <laughs> that was how John got me embroiled with Jim. <laughs> but what's the job involved? Just stuffing envelopes. However, he's, he's quite right about the committee. They're very committed, very enthusiastic, very supportive committee, which is great. So the, what has emerged as the most important thing about the group meetings, which we have on the first Wednesday of the month, is the social side of it. Yes. The, the contact with people. Somebody described macular degeneration as the best kept secret of Shetland because nobody knew who had it and who didn't. And that first meeting, oh, there's so-and-so, there's so-and-so. People we've done for years and no idea they had the problem. And so we focus very much on that side of it. So that we, every meeting obviously ends up with a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and biscuit or whatever. We have celebratory party. We've had two fabulous Christmas parties and our first birthday party was quite a momentous event as well. Uh, we do things like going to the Panto, the, the Shackford Panto, which is good fun. Um, going out for lunches. We, we've done two or three of those. This year, when we had all sorts of plans for what we were going to do over the summer months, of course, it has all come to naught. Yeah. We've tried to keep in touch, as John says, with the newsletter, the, the View from the Edge. We changed that to living with the virus in the early months, and that was just letting people know what was going on and what could be done under circumstances, etc. We decided now we've had enough of the virus, so we've gone back to living on the edge, or to <laughs> view from the edge. Um, the first of which went out yesterday, and, and that was technical problems too. Um, telephone calls and emails have carried on right throughout COVID obviously. And we have members in the outlying aisles, particularly in the, the northern aisles of Anston Yell, who have great difficulty getting to meetings. And so are, are, are in telephone contact regularly to keep them up to date with what's going on and what fun we're having. We have a monthly talk from uh, both on, the, on our uh, regular conference calls now and in our general proper meetings. Uh, we have speakers of all sorts from professional people like the ophthalmic surgeon, the some consultant that we have, Dr. Byrne, uh, patients with their various problems, nutritionists, uh, well, I've got a whole list of people, um, dietitians, adult learning center, the MSP came to visit us, the, the member for the Scottish Parliament, a solicitor, optometrist, fire and uh, rescue people, library people, all sorts. Uh, I think, is that okay. all okay. I say at the moment? I think. Well, oh, it's, it's one a, it, thing. Yeah, go on, please. Can I go oh. add one, one thing? that we are really cross that we had just got this moving when COVID started. We had the first of these. We decided that after injections in the Gilbert Bain Hospital in Merwick, that really we didn't want to be coming out. We could do it sitting and having a cup of coffee and winding down afterwards. So we started up the Haven, we tentatively called it, whereby we have a room where we've got coffee, tea, biscuits. People can come and sit there for as long as they like after their injections. And they can talk or they can sit in silence or whatever. And we just got that going, got the first ones going, and we had to stop. Yeah. For obvious reasons in a, ho in a, ho a hospital. Um, <laughs> that, I think that'll do for now. Okay. We okay. said that the welcome, welcome pack. Welcome pack, which to, to raise awareness and invite people to join this, the, the support group. Uh, that goes that some of those in the hospital with the, the medical staff there. 
the local opticians have got them. Uh, the local um, health centres all have them. So they're all over the place. We're trying to get the word out, get all these people back. But and and that's, that's, all, that's all that anyone can ask. And it is so vitally important that that continues. The, the social aspect in its many forms mm. are, uh, is, is vital at, at any time, but actually... Now, even more so, uh, I, can, I can only imagine, uh, you know, the framework uh, that you have there, uh, you know, with, with, the, with the limitations uh, of being an island anyway, and the services generally being maybe spread about, that uh, the more people who are aware of what you are doing, uh, and are more people who get as much information from you, whether that, as you say, that be by uh, newsletters or telephone calls or emails for those who do have uh, internet, uh, etc. That is, it's vital. It's it's a lifeline. So uh, yeah, it can uh, it, it it all can only be a good thing. There are uh, new new friendships have been formed. Old friendships have been resurrected. I don't know what I was going to say. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, uh, and, um, oh, sorry, Paul, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I, that happens to me a lot. <laughs> we can always come back to it anyway. Yes. Yeah. Every conversation that I, have, that, that I have with people or anybody has or uh, correspondence that I get says, when can we meet again? When can we meet again? That social side that you're just yeah. saying is so, so vital. Yeah, yeah. Because we've got a lot of very lonely people out here. Oh, I, I can imagine it. I think uh, the, the whole world feels lonely at the moment, so I can, yeah. uh, I, I can, I can totally relate to that uh, uh, in regards to it. So, okay, so I, I just say, every, everyone's requirements are obviously different. Some people are more tech aware and they're quite happy to use these sort of things, but we know that there's just as many people who it's a, it's a dark art, it's alien technology and they can never get on with it and they're reliant on a just a good old telephone call. Uh, and of course in these times that's that, that's not ideal, but it's it's better than no contact at all. So it, it's vitally important that the uh, the services that use uh, uh, offer there continue in 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 the best way you possibly can, uh, staying within obviously guidelines, etc. So uh, no, absolutely, uh, it's to be commended on that side. So one of the things you alluded to there uh, regarding the the injection clinic and how that's working now. From I understand it, and this will be, I think this will be quite interesting for the viewer uh, to understand the logistics for an individual to go and get uh, an injection for the wet AMD in, in, on mainland, uh, I suppose, you know, it's a case of, oh yes, I've got to go to my local hospital and it's 10 minutes away in a taxi and I might be there for three or four hours uh, with a delay, I'll have my injection and I'm just another 10 minutes back home. And that's okay, it's still not brilliant, but it's, 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 it's acceptable and it's done. That generally, isn't the situation where you are? So, can you uh, can you explain uh, for the viewers a little bit more about that and and just the process? Yeah, the, and, that and to... kind of happened when we we started the support group, and I was attending every every support group meeting in in those early days in uh, in the autumn of two thousand and eighteen. And one thing that that came across very apparent was that our, our members were most concerned, and it was very much an eye-opener to me, that for their wet macular monthly injections, they had to go to Aberdeen uh, for these injections. Now, when you're talking to somebody on the mainland about, oh, they've got to go to Aberdeen for their, their injections, there is virtually no understanding of what that involves um, getting to Aberdeen from Shetland um, involves a 14 hour ferry trip each way. Um, so it takes the best part of 
three days out of somebody's life every month. And and that that piece of sea from Lerwick uh, to Aberdeen is some of the most horrific sea around our, our coastline. And so to take a 14 hour ferry ride and then have to get from the ferry terminal to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, have their injection, which is upsetting enough, and then have to get back to the terminal for the ferry going back overnight again with another 14 hour ferry trip <laughs> up and, and down uh, is bad enough once, but to do it every four or six weeks yeah. is, is quite horrific. And even more horrific when you're in your eighties or nineties and maybe you need a carer with you. The, the other alternative was to catch a very early flight from, from Sumbra uh, to Aberdeen, something like quarter to eight in the morning. And for those that don't know the geography of Shetland, Sumbra Airport is 30 miles south of Lerwick, right on the very southern tip. So to, to check in before quarter to eight and to actually arrive at Sumbra, we've got well, we had people in their 80s and 90s um, getting up at 4 a.m. in the morning, flying to, to Aberdeen, very often with a carer, and then flying back the same day, um, probably not getting home until 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I soon realised that, that that was just not the way that the National Health Service should be providing the, the, these services. So I started a programme of engaging with NHS Shetland and the provider of the service in Aberdeen, NHS Grampian, and embarked on a, a, a period of shuttle diplomacy between my, my home and office in Inverness, uh, Lerwick and, and Aberdeen. Um, I have to confess, I was quite fortunate in meeting some people in both NHS organisations who readily grasped the, 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 the problem. Um, I was also supported by our support group who provided me with these, which quite frankly are horror stories. Um, when, when you have um, a, a patient in their 90s suffering from dementia, who needs close personal contact and care during that journey. And, and everybody knows what close personal care involves. Yeah. Um, that can be very distressing, not just for the member, but also for the carer. And, and it was something that, that had to stop. Cutting a very long story short, I was signposted to a, uh, a consultant uh, Dr. Gray's Hospital in Elgin. Um, and Dr. Gray's Hospital had been running a very successful remote clinic, um, joining in with Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. This is where the patient went to the remote clinic in Elgin, had their scan. It was looked at in real time in Aberdeen where uh, the consultant authorized the injection or said, no, they'd better come into Aberdeen. So we were building on that, and there's absolutely no reason if they could do it between Elgin and Aberdeen with 21st century technology, why can't we do it between Shetland and Aberdeen? The first hurdle to overcome was the scanner that uh, they had at Sir Gilbert Bain Hospital in Lerwick. Uh, it was a Zeiss one, it was past its sell-by date, and with, with just a little bit of persuasion, NHS Shetland bought the most up-to-date Heidelberg scanner uh, that enabled the scans to be done uh, in, in Lerwick. But we needed a consultant. We needed a consultant to be on site, and we were fortunate enough to uh, obtain the services of Dr. Mike Byrne, 
who has been an absolute prince for the Shetland Islands um, in undertaking this clinic on a monthly basis, which involves him coming over to Shetland for three days. And um, very often people think of Shetland with, with bad weather in the winter. The big problem is the summer with, with the mist that surrounds Sumbra Airport, where the plane can actually be uh, over Sumbra, but can't land because they can't see the end of the runway because both ends of the runway are over the sea and they have to go back. But Mike has, has really been absolutely brilliant. He's taken it on the chin, waited for the weather to clear. Some consultants would have just thrown Teddy in the corner and said no. <laughs> but no, he's not missed a clinic. And our first clinic took place in, in May 2019, uh, with what we thought was going to be the maximum number, which was 24 people. Okay. Um, these clinics have been going on every month, and literally patients have been coming out of the woodwork. Patients who have been diagnosed with wet AMD, who, looking at the journey involving going to Aberdeen, have said, I'm not doing that. Um, mm -hmm. But now that the clinic's available in, in Lerwick, uh, it's just grown from strength to strength. So much so that very often two consultants are required to run the clinic. Um, and they're now operating with over 80 patients for a clinic where we thought it was just a, a, a couple of dozen. And it's just gone from, from strength to strength. And it really is a testament to Dr. Byrne um for him staying the course and um making sure that that clinic took took place um my biggest worry once we started the clinic was the fact that had i opened pandora's box yeah. um we got the clinic going but was it sustainable um how fragile was it um so we continued the shuttle diplomacy um, bet between Inverness, Aberdeen and Lowick and I was delighted in January this year to secure a commitment both from NHS Grampian and NHS Shetland that the clinic was, was sound not just in the, in the short term but the medium and the long term and, and they backed that up by NHS Shetland um, earmarking money uh, to train two nurse injectors so that if the consultants could not get onto the island that the scans could be done could be re viewed remotely yeah. by Dr Byrne in, in Elgin and the injections authorised. Now that training is taking place as, as we speak and, and that secures the long-term commitment by NHS Shetland to this on-island uh, clinic. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful to members of the support group in supporting me during that, that time because they provided me with the stories. There was a lot of behind the scenes work going on with people not least of which the Lord Lieutenant, who um, helped us amazingly with, with publicity. BBC Radio Shetland, Shetland helped us with, with publicity. And of course, we have that cooperation from uh, NHS Shetland and NHS Grampian. So it was a it was a win-win. Not only have we repatriated every patient now from Aberdeen Royal Infirmary to Shetland, but it's freed up more clinic time in Aberdeen for them to be able to deal with more people in the more rural parts of, of southern Aberdeenshire. So uh, there has been pluses for, for, for everybody. Um, but yeah, we, we are immensely grateful uh, to NHS Shetland for um, devoting the, uh, the, the money to train these nurse injectors 
And, and this isn't, these are nurses that are top of their trade, advanced nurse practitioners who have the interest and the desire to want to train to be able to do this. And, and I, I certainly, and I'm sure um, Claire and Peter will agree with me, I take my hat off to them that, that they want to be trained and they want to provide that service. So absolutely, that's really how, how the remote clinic in, in Shetland has been set up. Not so remote, I might say, because Dr. Mike Burns attendance every month and, and now the, uh, the willingness of, of the nurse practitioners to be, to be trained. Um, but that would never have been achieved without the successful support group. No, have. absolutely, absolutely, and it's uh, it, again, it is a, a it's a brilliant thing, uh, and it and yeah, it's it when you look at it in hindsight, it's it's obviously going to help everybody. It is obviously the main focus is to help the actual individual, but like you say, in in, in many respects, it actually also helps the NHS. Uh, yeah. you know, even with the even with the initial funding and training costs, actually, in the great scheme of things, yeah. there'll be. Can, a I, just, can I just highlight Paul? For anybody who will be viewing this, um, particularly in, in mainland UK, our headquarters is in Andover in Hampshire. And the journey that these people were having to undertake, it's like saying to somebody in Andover, you've got to go to Norwich every month for your injection. Yeah. And by the way, you're you're in your 80s and 90s and you'll need to take your carer with you. It's like saying to somebody in Birmingham, you've got to go to Newcastle every month for your, your injection. Those are the distances involved. You had enough if you're in your 40s and 50s and maybe 60s, but when you're in your 70s and 80s, it really is an, a horrific journey. No, absolutely. And like you say, I mean, in, in that scenario, even in a car, even if you were looking for the car, from Birmingham to uh, uh, Newcastle is only around three, three and a half hours. It's certainly a lot more of that on uh, uh, flight wise or, or certainly ferry wise. So, uh, yeah. no, it, it, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, it is a proper, uh, again, pardon the pun, a proper eye opener uh, is to see the, the logistic and the geographical differences in, in how it was. Uh, one, lady, one lady who will be nameless um, emailed me the morning after her injection, her first injection mm. in Lerwick, and said, this morning I woke up in my own bed, <laughs> not in a bunk on the ferry, and um, my life has been changed. So no names, no pat drill. Oh, no, no, no. It's no. Nothing as we talk. Yeah. <laughs> excellent excellent so uh before, yeah so before the the clinic here began life was dominated i had to go every month mm. and life was dominated by those three days of traveling up and down and obviously it took longer and longer to recover afterwards it was all the, the journey itself was more of a concern than the actual injections the actual procedures you didn't know whether the ferry or the plane would, would run because of the weather conditions. You had to get, if you live in the northernmost isles of Shetland, up in Unst, not only had you got to get to Lerwick, to get your, or to get from Lerwick to Aberdeen, you had to get to Lerwick. So from Unst, you've got another two ferry crossings, short ferry crossings, in this yeah. You're still going to do it. Now, we just look out of the window and think, oh dear, it's a bit misty today. Will the plane land? Right, okay, injections tomorrow. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, it, it's just changed life completely. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it is. It's a, it's a very good thing. And, uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's all I can say is uh, for, from your point of view and from John's point of view is, uh, uh, yeah, a brilliant idea and concept to, uh, to think of it in the first place. So uh, I'm sure everyone would agree with that. So, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. So there are a lot of very grateful people around Shetland. I'm sure, I'm sure An increasing are. number, I guess. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
So moving on, uh, and this is more directed at uh, uh, you, I believe, Peter, is the uh, the publicity side of the support group there. Uh, can you uh, give us a little bit of uh, background uh, on that aspect? Well, yes, I will start off <clears throat> with some background. The NHS statistics for 2012 said that those 2.4% of the population who suffer from one or other form of AMD. Now, Shetland has a population of just shy of 23,000. So uh, statistically, there must be something like 550 people in the archipelago who have AMD. Now, Many of those may not yet be diagnosed, but statistically, that is how many there could be. Now, we have 80 to 90 attending the clinic, as John said, and we, as a support group, have 35 members. So you can see there's a huge um, problem uh, in getting to all these people um, to tell them what we can do for them. One of the things which doesn't help us at all uh, is GDPR because we can't approach people directly because we, we, we need their permission and all this sort of thing. So that, that, that's just a, a bit of background. And what, what, what have we actually done as a support group? Well, last year we went to an agricultural show there are several small agricultural shows on Shetland. Okay. Um, we got one new member and we met with the local MP and MSP. Um, and uh, there were a few people who came to talk to us who have no idea about it. Um, mm. So that, that was good. And then another thing we did was we took a stand at the Scalloway Age and Opportunity Fair. Now, Scalloway is, I think it's the third largest village in Shetland. Um, and it's something that was purely organized by that village. Uh, and it was a, a number of NGOs mainly who were there just to tell people what's out there because that's, a big problem that we find in the support group and we keep coming across things and say well I just didn't know it was out there. Mm. Um, another thing we've done we, we gave a, a talk to our local community council um, very well received and as the member who we know best said nobody fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but nobody on that committee uh, had a clue about AMD. And I would say the youngest person was probably mid-late 40s. Mm. So there were people who could very well have had it of an age when the, it would be developing there. Um, and uh, they, they went away and said, oh, yes, we will. You'll have to think about this and uh, etc. Because we wanted to know how can we get the word out in the community about us and about AMD. So that was uh, another thing we did, and then we um, had did a I think it was only a few hours in Tesco. You know the, the checkout sort of at the end of the checkout. Uh, we had a, a little stall there and we're talking to people. And uh, what was really evident to us, because, because we were in Lurby and we had um, a couple of members who lived pretty close by who came and were on the stand, they just knew. It seemed like they knew everybody. Of course, everybody stopped to pass the time of day with them, etc. And we, <coughs> uh, so we could uh, try and get the world out, the word out that way. Mm -hmm. 
Um, okay. Going beyond that, what what can can be done or what should be done? And I feel very strongly that um, we should be doing more than just supporting those with AMD. We we need to target the under fifties, um, and because of the importance of early diagnosis we, we, we need to really get home this message about having regular eye checks uh, because there are so many people who only ever go to an optometrist if something develops they don't do it on a regular basis like going to the dentist uh, although there are quite a lot of people who don't do that either but um, and, and, and that, I think, would, would help um, because eye checks anyway can point the way to all sorts of other things that may be not just AMD. Uh, you know, we've got the diabetic retinopathy and a whole load of other things. And one thing, and I think this is very futuristic, that I would like to see if we could do anything about it, is to try and get it on the school curriculum. Uh, if you think the, the, the incidence, uh, we've said the incidence in the population was 2.4%, in the over 60s, it doubles to 4.8%, and in the over 80s, you're getting on to five times as many. So, the, the, in, in the education system, that they, they have this uh, health and well-being aspect that the um, pupils are taught about, and I can't see why that something along the lines of being aware about the possibility of AMD developing shouldn't be included, um, and the, the uh, other thing that we can do is, well, we know about the Amsler grid, the little um, chart thing where you can look at uh, a, a piece of paper with um, vertical and horizontal lines on it. Yeah. And you don't see them as vertical and horizontal lines. And there's any waviness in any part of the paper, that is an indication that uh, you have AMD or you certainly have a problem. Um, so, I mean, that's a very simple thing. It's not high tech at all, it's just a piece of paper that um, people could be told about. Um, and going on from there, I would like to look at the possibility of making a presentation to the full council about AMD and to try and uh, raise its awareness through that. And um, maybe we ought to look at talking to more of these local community councils because there are, I'm not sure exactly how many off the top of my head, but there's maybe eight or 10 of them all together. Um, but generally just trying to get the word out there. No, absolutely. And again, the, the awareness aspect for everybody is the same. And you, you might be surprised that, you know, it's it's still a problem on in, in the mainland. It's, uh, you know, there's still a lot of people who don't know what macular degeneration is. And there's a lot of people who, don't realize of the support services uh, that are available nationwide. So, it, uh, you know, I have to say it's not just uh, in somewhere like uh, uh, the, the Shetlands or the Orkneys, etc. It is, it's a nationwide problem. And it's a, it's a thing that as an organization ourselves, we are constantly putting out awareness, training to even hospital staff, even opticians, you know, and I know, uh, you know, you, you've got opticians uh, in the Shetlands who uh, who can who could help in this area, and it's something that they 
may not have even been aware of before. So again, I, I, I can't stress the importance of getting that awareness out there to as many people in as many forms as possible. Yeah, the GDPR is an issue, absolutely. Uh, but it's something that we all have to deal with. Uh, a bit like uh, uh, the, the the virus in that respect. Uh, it's, you know, it's something that we, we just, uh, we have to work within the guidelines uh, uh, provided. But that doesn't mean to say that we still can't go out there like you say, to the shows, to even just Tesco's, your local supermarkets or whatever, and, and get word us out because you will find people. You will come across people who will say, I had no idea you existed. And I've yeah. been having this problem for a year. So, no, uh, again, you, you are certainly going about it the right way and you've got the right uh, mentality to uh, to bring it forward as well. Yeah, Paul, the, the, for anybody watching... The clue is in the title. Uh, AMD is age-related macular degeneration. And it usually affects people aged over 50. But the really frightening aspect and the aspect that people really take on board is that if you suffer with age-related macular degeneration, there is a 70% chance you will pass it on to your children. And that is why the Macular Society has one single aim and only one single aim, and that is to find a cure for macular degeneration. If we don't find it in this generation, we will find it in the next generation. And the Macular Society funds over 20 research projects every year purely with finding a cure for age-related macular degeneration. And our Shetland group have been very successful in, in, in that. And, and I'm, I invite Peter to, to share some of the, your fundraising ideas um, with, with anybody watching, Peter. Right, the, the only thing I, I, I would like to say, I think, is that, you know, we 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 um, haven't haven't really had any stake in the ground as to really what we should be doing um, and where you know where we should be going and should we be getting into this area of the under fifties that I firmly believe is is really vital. I, I don't know, but that that's I know it's a. a a, a thing that's just re really a bee in my bonnet. Oh, okay, yeah, it's, uh, but uh, anything you can, anything you can do. There, what, what they've been very good at in Shetland is doing a two-pronged approach, uh, whereby they, they raise money uh, to fund the research projects uh, run by the Macula Society, and they also raise money for, to run the support and group services that are so necessary and so vital in, in Shetland. And Shetland Island is, are by nature generous people. And this is Shetland Islanders helping Shetland Islanders. And the group has been amazingly successful in, in, in that aim. So, uh, so finally then, what's, what's the future? The future. <laughs> yeah, well, well yeah, we, we, yeah, I'm, yeah, and believe me, I'm not asking for this week's lottery numbers, although that would be nice <laughs> if you wanted to give them. But no, generally, uh, what is your feelings moving forward of how you see uh, the group in 12 months' time and what plans you have uh, with, uh, with, you know, with uh, assisting your members uh, and uh, and going to the various uh, uh, other islands, uh, Walsh, Yell, and uh, and things like that. So yeah, just to, just to finish off, uh, what what plans have you got? Well, this some of the things that we've tried to do this year that obviously will carry on in the future, uh, and stemming mainly from the outer isles and the far distant parts of the main island, which is mainland. It's getting members, getting in touch with members. So or making members 
So we, we might want to go out, or we do want to go out to them, because obviously from what John was saying before about the, the, the health conditions of so many of the members, they're not necessarily able to come down to Lerwick for meetings. Well, that getting them to Lerwick for meetings or social events is one of the things that we are exploring. How can we do that? How can we finance it? How practically can we do these things? And similarly, going out to the islands so the committee and anybody else who wants to join us to go out. To, we, were, we were going last year, we were going to, oh, to lunch with the with people on Walsa. There were quite a few um, patients on Walsa. And so we wanted to go and meet them, have lunch with them, show them what we're like. And we wanted to, that was a starting point then to move on to further distances like Yale and others. And just spread the word out within the islands because it's, that it's not just the patient that has the problem, but the whole family and the whole sort of social structure of that particular person. So that, uh, apart from carers. So we want to do that. We want to get the, the, the coffee mornings back or the coffee days back at the clinic. I think that's yeah. very important. That would be relatively easy to sort out once we're back in action. Once the world's back in action. Um, and I guess those are the... It's, it's all comes back with the contact with people. Absolutely. It would be nice if we could, if we could get more people onto Zoom calls. That would be good. Uh, because telephone conferences have got a, a better than nothing. But I know we have members who can't actually deal with the telephone because they can't hear properly on the telephone. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. can't use the technology like like Zoom calls, so we've got to write to them, or and we can't go and visit them because of GDPR and, and insurance and all sorts of things. So it's, it's finding a way through the maze. Absolutely. Well, we'll okay. yeah, and, and we and we will we will get back to the face to face stuff. That is, you know, we've that's that's how we've got to think, and it and it and it will be that way. We're we're all in the same boat in that respect. Uh, but yeah, we there is there is sunnier times ahead, shall we say? But uh, well, guys, I uh, I, I want to thank you, uh, uh, Claire, Peter, and John. Uh, Brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, broadcast here. Uh, a lot of really useful information, and I think it'll uh, yeah open people's eyes to uh, some of the so, so some of the the, the difficulties uh, you, uh, you have there in uh, in providing uh, a very worthwhile service. Uh, as always, we will provide a, a, a viewer with uh, relative links uh, and things like that. And obviously, this will go out on Facebook. Uh, but uh, uh, in, in that meantime, again, I'd just like to thank you all for your time. Well, thank you, Paul. And thank yes, you, yeah. Optilec, for being so willing to work with us. Not just for today. Optilec sponsored our Volunteer Development Day in, in Kirkwall last year. Um, and we are we are grateful for that. We're grateful to to have you on board, working with us and part of our team. So thank you, Optilec. Thank you. Great stuff. Okay. Well, uh, on on that on that note, <laughs> well, uh, we'll we will we'll end it, and uh, we'll we'll see you hopefully in the flesh soon enough. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye bye now. Bye. bye.